in what your puny primitive humanoid brain laughingly call the universe, there are millions and billions of stars. And from a certain point of view, certain configurations of stars will start to suggest to certain impressionable minds shapes and words. We only had to destroy a couple inhabited planets to spell Trek off the Star Trek Philosophy Podcast. And today we have several powerful members of the Q Continuum, which is really, I mean, we are the ultimate super group. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, superhero, super celebrity, we're just all of the above in every category. That's awesome. So we have several upstanding continuum members here with us today to give you the news on life, the universe, and everything. It doesn't change much, kind of boring, but we report on it anyway, because it is the news. First, we have our field correspondent who just returned from a trip back in time to restructure the English language so that about is pronounced a boot, Brandon Kirby. Forget poverty, disease, and all that uh, crap. Concerned about a boat. Boring. I fully agree. And our political commentator who has been spending time as the scarecrow lately, Hillary Muckovitz. Of course, we've all been the scarecrow. And our anchorman who's stopped for a pint at the brewery on the way to Alpha Centauri, Chris McGee. One of the best pints I've ever had. And last, but certainly not least, the queue is never least, filling in for Bill Allen, who is out this week off battling the M Continuum, I'm Ben McLean, the Quinn in the red shirt. <laughs> and in case you didn't pick up the not-so-subtle hints, today we are discussing Q and the Q Continuum and its appearances in Star Trek and related media. <laughs> Do it. Um, yeah. Well, I think, first of all, I might just repeat a couple of the points I made in one of our earliest episodes for Tricosophy. And these are just a few things that people don't, people who aren't real hardcore fans who have watched documentaries about the show and stuff might not realize. And that is, first of all, John Delancey is the man. I mean, he's like the Jesus of great acting. <laughs> Um, oh, that's because, a pretty high mark there. <laughs> yeah. I oh, mean, he's bigger he, than Jesus. Sorry, it's about the Beatles fan of me talking. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, seriously, he, he's the man of, uh, in terms of being an actor. goes. The Q character that we all know and love was not hatched by Roddenberry or any of the Star Trek writers. Was not it is. To be <laughs> yeah, it, it is. That character, the way that character acts, thinks, behaves is a product of John Delancey's brain. And I would defend that on the grounds that in Encounter at Farpoint, the first Star Trek The Next Generation episode, and the first Star Trek episode featuring Q, Q does not have any funny lines. In this screenplay, he is a menacing character. He has some sort of anachronisms about his opinions of what humans are. You know, he's a couple centuries behind, and maybe that was meant to be a little bit funny. But on on the whole, he's a very menacing character in the screenplay. Just read flat, this was the author's intention of the screenplay. Mm -hmm. But what John Delancey did was he took this very dark, serious material, this very dark, serious line about humanity and humanity's place in, in the universe, and he gave it a funny articulation which showed the lighter side of all of this dark and heavy stuff and gave us this ironic Q character that everybody loves. And that whole subplot wasn't even supposed to be in the pilot. They'd written the Farpoint material yep. and then they wanted to have a full-length movie instead of just a short pilot episode. And so they had to add this whole entire second plot which was sort of thrown together at the last minute. So Q wasn't the main subject of Encounter at Farpoint, 
at all. He stole the spotlight. I mean, that was incredible. And if you consider on top of that, that John Delancey has extremely serious dyslexia. He has extreme difficulty in reading. And as a result, he had to memorize every single line under the most difficult circumstances anytime he did any part or anything. But you would never tell that because the character that he presents is amazingly well-read and very deep in his way. He's very deep in his knowledge, perhaps, uh, and extremely shallow in his wisdom, which we might get into in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, he's read every book ever, and he presents a character who seems to have done that and then just doesn't care. <laughs> but anyway, so that's sort of our, uh, my tribute to John Delancey right there is that he's totally the man, and we can credit him for having created the Q character. It's only in later episodes when the writers have picked up on what Delancey's done with the character that they give him funny lines to say. But originally <laughs> it was all... And the funny titles from then on. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm not going to attack which, which that, is, but I'm going to say... Which is appropriate, I think. Yeah, it, it made sense given the where Delancey was going with the character. But I was just going to say we can thank not Roddenberry, not the scriptwriters, but Delancey himself for the Q character. And That's really true. more than any other character who wasn't a regular on Star Trek, Delancey is probably, I'd say, probably the most famous non-regular. The most recognizable non-regular on any Star Trek show, I'd say. With the possible yeah. exception of, of that Zek guy from PS9, because he was in Princess Bride. So. <laughs> oh, Guinan. Or Dukat. Oh, I forgot Guinan. Yeah, Guinan. Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg's more recognizable than Delancey. You're right. Except I thought she was a regular, sort of. Maybe she wasn't, now that I think about it. Mm, She's recurring. More recurring. Yeah. She recurred a lot more than, uh, than Delancey, though. Didn't yeah, she? she? Well, I, this is our topic. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. That's a natural question. Not yeah. Natural, a question. Now let's get into the philosophy, then. <laughs> yeah. What? If you're Picard, and Q comes along, and gives your first officer the power of Q, what sort of an argument do you give to Riker to uh, bring him back down to Earth? Uh, read Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, that was the... I, I drew a parallel in my book with uh, <laughs> the Mrs. Gygis, and I still look from some other... Trek officers whose their names are escaping me, but they wrote a wonderful book on the ethics of Star Trek. And it, it, it was the myth of Gygis. It was the same myth that J.R.R. Tolkien took his uh, idea from, where a fellow who gets a ring and he puts it on and he becomes invisible. And he uses this to assassinate a king, seduce the queen, uh, and he, he, he does exactly what. Uh, Plato was hoping uh, that the rest of us would do, given this newfound power. Expecting. I, I wouldn't say hoping. <laughs> well, okay, fair enough. Um, then Socrates is left to have a discussion over what would you do to prevent that? Picard says, I would put human morality up against the power of the Q any day. So in what sense, I mean, how, how do you justify that? How, how do you convince Riker to recoil from this power? How, how do you actually substantiate Picard's claims that it's better to uh, have this human power over the power of Q? Well, I might say something real quick here. That is, as a visually impaired person, someone who can't drive because of my poor eyesight. I cannot empathize with LaForge in that episode at all. I mean, yeah, that I, just, weird. I, I cannot empathize with that at all. That makes no sense. 
Well, you have an option. You can, if you are blind and you have an opportunity to regain your sight, I no, cannot if, imagine giving, and, and no one's being hurt by that. I if, cannot imagine giving that up for any reason. In the case of LaForge, because of the technology, he actually has abilities that he wouldn't otherwise. It's very well, that's different. true. Yeah, well, but he didn't have to give those up. He could have just said, hey, can you also give me this supervision? And Riker would have been like, oh, sure. I mean, he didn't have to give any of that up. Yeah, but apparently he couldn't aesthetically appreciate Tasha, though, before that. Before Riker gave him sight. Which also makes no sense. And he can see it or you don't. <laughs> What's that? So he could still see curves with the visor. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it either. That, it seems like either you can see it or you can't. Well, he wasn't able to see her uh... orange lipstick. I don't know. <laughs> maybe she got. Maybe he got a new appreciation or something like that. Okay. Well, so it doesn't make sense then. So for you, Ben, it, it makes sense to go along with the the newfound power. Wait, wait. Let me say this. It doesn't make sense for. Wesley to want to grow up too fast. So his refusal of the gift of, of being immediately grown up makes total sense. In fact, I think most of the refusals, perhaps all of the refusals of all the other gifts, make sense. Even Data's decision that he doesn't want to be made into a real boy artificially like that I didn't make, makes that. some sense. I didn't, well, I think, that, go ahead. I think that makes some sense because what he's trying to accomplish is a project of Becoming the kind of person in his soul that would be worthy of being called human, rather than simply getting all the right tissues. I think the real essence of David's quest is to become that that kind of person in his soul that could be, that could truly be called human. And it, as such, the shortcut that Riker offers uh, it really isn't the real essence of what data in his life is looking for. It's it's a sort of a false idol or a false you know a false thing. So I, I understand giving up all the other gifts, but LaForge, that makes no sense. Yeah, he just didn't want to have to thank Q for it. He didn't want to be indebted to Q in any way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and still that I'm sorry, that, that makes no sense. It, it, it didn't have any strings attached. I mean, if you get if you're blind and you you need an opportunity to see, it's not going to hurt anyone. There's no strings attached. I'd be fine. I I can't understand him saying no to that. I mean, it's an injury well, and it's healed. Well, what about medical research that was done in the Jews during the Holocaust? Or remember this horrific nightmare? Somebody told me they once had that. Uh, he's waiting for a lung transplant. He got it, but he found out after the surgery had been done that he somebody had shot his kid and gave him his lungs as a cruel joke. Don't any of those scenarios make you think, okay, the indebtedness for this gift is worse than not having the gift? Well, like I said, I don't and think... This only, and this was only two seconds episode, too. It's not like it's been even established that he had any benevolence. Yeah, I, I I don't think any any significant indebtedness came with that in this episode. If it did, then yeah, that you had you'd have a point. But I don't see how it would. Well, it was before this shift. Yeah, I think he said that. I just don't like who I'd have to thank for the the gift. Who I'd have to thank? That doesn't seem well. Okay, I guess if I can liken it to. A woman who some misogynistic suitor sends all kinds of material gifts to because he wants to get in her pants. And she refuses the gifts because she doesn't like who they're from. Right. I can I can I can understand that. Well, something but else too, Ben. It's hard to liken the regaining of your sight. For for someone who is visually impaired like I am. And and what a handicap that is. Uh, at least socially more than anything else, I, I have a hard time making that jump from the forwards being able to see again 
to a woman refusing a repulsive suitor. Ben, I have a thought on this. Sure. I know we're getting off topic here, and I hope we still have uh, we'll have time to discuss other aspects of Q. But uh, I'll yeah. just say we'll this about the LaForge issue. Um, when he says, first of all, when he says, "I don't like who I have to thank," he's not saying that I don't like you, Commander Riker. It's the person who gave you these powers that did this to me. So he doesn't like Q necessarily. It's not not Riker. Well, it could be, but it may even be both of them. But the way I read it, it's, I don't like Q, therefore, I don't like the fact that he made this possible. Um, another thing, too, is remember in the Q Who episode, when Q wanted to become a member of the crew, what did Picard do? He flat out refused. Q offered, hey, I know all these great things. I can help you out. I can be your guide. And Picard says, we'll just muddle along without you just fine. Because that's what we do. We prefer to discover these things on our own. We prefer not to cheat in a way. We prefer to do it our own way without help. And maybe you that's know, another aspect of what uh, the Forge is saying there. I, You know, I was born this way. I'm fine just being this way. I I also think if I were Picard, I would have negotiated with Q and Q who a little bit more. I would have said, well, we can't make you a member of the crew. That, that's just, I don't think that's possible because you'd have to go through Starfleet Academy and all that sort of stuff the way any other being would have to. And I don't think you could even qualify to get into Starfleet Academy. But what we can do is work together with you to go see some neat stuff and add to our scientific knowledge. I don't see why, you know, it seemed to do with, we're out here to discover new life. And Q, he's new life. Mm -hmm. I mean, discover, uh, what, what is it? Uh, discover new life and new civilizations. The Q, I mean, they, they are, um, they are that. Picard said to him directly, uh, you are the most unique we've found, and to learn more about it, is provocative. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, even if they don't trust him, there's a lot of people they make deals with in the Star Trek universe that they don't trust entirely. I mean, look at all the stuff that uh, characters on DS9 depend on Quark for. <laughs> uh, but, there's, there, I know, I, I don't. Say, but regardless yeah, of that, Q wouldn't have taken that offer that you would have given to him because he wanted to be a member of the crew. He didn't want to yeah. be on the sidelines <laughs> just helping out here and there to the Starfleet he, What I'm saying is instead of making him a member of the crew, what I try to argue with to him is you don't really want to be a member of the crew. What you want is to go on an adventure with the crew. And we might do that. I mean, if I was a captain, you know, I'd, I'd be a little more like Kirk than like Picard a lot of the time because I'd be like, yeah, let's let's try it. Let's check that out. <laughs> uh, even if there's a guy who's shady who we don't trust all the way, we're out here to explore, you know? <laughs> and that means yeah. encountering some dangers, and one of those dangers might be dealing with some shady people some of the time. Uh, like Picard said, you know, quite frankly, we don't trust you. <laughs> That was yeah. the only reason he gave, pretty much, and that's the only reason he needed. Yeah, well, the thing is, they don't have to extend any more trust to Q than they already have. Q is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. It doesn't matter how much trust they extend to Q. He, it, their trust doesn't give him any more power than he has. Maybe emotionally is the only sense in which... Well, that's an really interesting point you've hit upon there. Maybe Q isn't A as powerful as he claims, or B, he's found some sort of need to be accepted. Well, he can't be all-powerful, because there are other members of the Q continuum. The concept of being all-powerful, in most, uh, in the judgment of most philosophers, implies some sort of a oneness. Uh, yeah. Because but if, if the you have Q two continuum beings is... of equal power, 
one, they wouldn't have all power because they couldn't exercise that power over the other. Yeah. There'd be a number of things that they couldn't do, and so it wouldn't be all powerful. Well, it's that's certainly true, but I might point out that the Q continuum is somewhat of a silly idea. And I don't think doing that kind of analysis on an idea which purports on the surface to be silly, if it's silly on the surface, it's not a refutation of the idea to say that it's silly underneath. Because sometimes you can judge a book by its cover. The, the Q continuum is silly all the way down, you know? <laughs> well, sure. I just, yeah, I get, what, I get what you're saying. I just, I, I think you could just, get away with saying they're very powerful beings, and then you can come up with all these wonderful thought experiments from there to help uh, develop our philosophy. Oh, you mean like, uh, is it possible to have a universe with multiple omnipotent beings? If so, what would omnipotence mean in that context? How powerful could they really be if there's more than one of them? Well, that's that's one. I mean, that's the issue at hand. There's a question I put forward earlier, like it is, I mean, having a discussion about ethics versus power. It's what could Picard have said with, uh, in order to convince Riker to do otherwise? I mean, I wanted to steer it into the direction that was in another episode that Picard so quickly dismissed the concept that you could be God. Well, why not? The universe is not so badly designed. What does that entail about Q's character? Uh, and I obviously the paradox. Uh, there's so many ways that you could take this. I, mean, I got really excited for the episode when I heard we were going to do it. But uh, it is silly. I grant you that it's silly. But there's a lot of thought experiments that come out of something silly. Yes, there are, and yeah, I, 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 I fully we, agree. We can I, be I very we serious agree. over the silly. I, I think we agree in the main. I'm just saying, uh, not everything Q says has to make sense in order to be true in the context of the Star Trek universe. Because it's just, you know, it, it, it's a fiction and uh, it's a little bit Alice in Wonderland-ish. Well, you could say that about Voyager. Well, yeah, but especially in the case of the Q. I mean, the, the Q is just... The Q don't even pretend to have a uh, naturalistic mechanistic explanation for all the stuff they do. They they just snap their fingers and... and uh, make witty remarks and stuff happens the way they want it. And in a way, they represent the Federation mentality of the super people that the uh, Enterprise crew are taken to its logical extreme. If you think about it. I don't follow you there. Well, in the 24th century, they have all, I think it's 24th, isn't it? They have all this wonderful technology, which gives them all this power to do whatever they want. They can travel faster than light. They can make people appear or disappear out of thin air with their holodecks. They can make food come from nowhere with their replicators. They are demigods descending from Mount Olympus, like uh, Riker in that, in his entrance scene. I mean, he is, he is Roddenberry's vision of man. Q comes along and shows where that kind of vision leads, where you have ultimate power and no substance. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. You, you just extended the power of that. Yeah, it's just extended that power, with, you know, and showing that just because you have power doesn't mean you have wisdom. And just because oh, you have knowledge doesn't mean you have wisdom. It, it's like um, classic mythology where you have the gods that are more like us, so they have all the same failings as humans with considerably more power. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, in Greek mythology anyway, uh, and in some other mythology. In Roman, and, and then there's been comparisons of you to the trickster characters. Yeah, Roman mythology is Greek mythology with the names changed. Yeah, with, with Romulus and Remus thrown in a wolf, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Q as the extension of the Federation ideal, or the Star Trek ideal, and it's sort of the self-parody of the Star Trek ideal, you know? Because he says to the show, which up to that point had been giving us a vision of man as having 
coming to his own and having matured to become this wonderful humanist vision that Roddenberry has, Q comes along and says, you guys have got a big head and you aren't all that and you, you, you know, <laughs> you're nowhere near as great and powerful and wise and good as you think you are. It's like, yeah, it's, it's one of the things the Joker says in The Dark Knight. He says, uh, when the chips are down, these so-called civilized people, they'll eat each other. And I'm afraid that's true for a lot of them. I certainly think that's true, as we see in DS9, that's true of the Federation at that time in history. It had more to do with the situation that human beings were in. Uh, they only gave off the appearance of having more evolved sensibilities, but in actual fact, when you remove them from those more advanced circumstances, your human condition hasn't really changed much. Yep, that's the point that Q makes. I think Roddenberry disagrees with Q and, and actually thinks that the human condition has been better. Because he has all these Aesops coming from, uh, that's the TV tropes term, you know, all these Aesops coming out of Picard, that Picard is actually a better person, you know, more wise and all that stuff than Q is. Well, but I think that critique comes into its own in DS9, I think. <laughs> well, and that seems, that seems to be the primary difference bet between, um, Next Generation in Deep Space Nine is Next Gen thinks that human nature is capable, of, that human beings are capable of evolving as a species, whereas Deep Space Nine is more, no, humanity is the same as it ever was. Yeah, I mean... Well, individuals are capable of evolving, but not entire species, unless they're not human. <laughs> yeah, of course, personally, I think putting moral growth, moral development, I guess you might say, in terms of evolution, I think is a categorical mistake myself, because evolution is supposed to be a strictly biological process, while uh, the sort of moral development is, is, is more conceptual in our thinking than in our biology. So I don't even put it in those terms, but if you are going to put it in those terms, then I agree. I think with the example you brought up and bring it back to Star Trek, first it was the Joker, his thought experiment. We were talking about Greek and Roman mythology. Well, there was a wrestler named Zeus who was the same actor who refuted the Joker when he was the large prisoner who took the bomb that could blow up the other ship in the Batman movie and threw it out the window. And he refused to kill other human beings to save uh, his own ship. And then you, you see that the Joker had underestimated a sense of morality. And then you have Picard who says, I will put this human morality over the Q. Q had more temporal power, had more power over physical nature. But human beings had more control over their souls. They they had more uh, wisdom, as you put it, uh, Ben, rather than knowledge. And so I think there's some sort of an assumption there that the well-being of our soul is more important than the well-being of our bodies. Or uh, an empowered soul is better than an empowered body. Yeah, I think... Basically, that might be it, although I wasn't bringing in as much metaphysics as that, but uh, I guess, yeah, that's about the gist of it. I, yeah. I distinguish from metaphysics and ethics as much as others. Well, uh, we won't go there, but I think, I mean, that was the question I asked earlier, but that was one of the answers that I had in mind when I asked the question that uh, Riker would be losing his soul if he pursued Q. There might be something more important than physical power. Yeah, yeah, the idea is power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So even though the Q power is, is very shiny and attractive, it might not be the best thing for your ethical and uh, spiritual development as a person to have that kind of, you know, power, because you could easily fall into all kinds of horrible temptations fairly quickly to get your own way over others and other people's free will and all that stuff. 
Well, that was Sarah's argument, too, that the Mrs. Guy just it led to a very disordered soul where you preferred lesser things to greater things. Oh, yeah, definitely. And Q was so disordered, Riker was going to follow that disorder. It, and that would have left him with a perverse valuation of things. And that's what would have corrupted his soul. Well, that that deals with that episode. So right. this has pretty much just been that one episode. There's that's so right. much other stuff to talk about. We'll have to make, definitely make this a two-parter, at least. We've got to talk about Q in uh, Voyager still. Oh, um, yeah. Euthanasia. Huh? We have the euthanasia issue in Voyager. Well, or... Yeah, it is wanting to cease to be immortal the same as euthanasia. Oh, oh, yeah, the, the Quinn episode. Okay, I was Pretty thinking sure of the Civil War. Death Wish. Yeah, I was thinking of that Civil War episode myself, but, yeah, I... Oh, uh, the Civil War episode is the consequences of that. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of wanting to skip to that, but uh, I guess we do have to talk about the Quinn guy as well. And we don't have time to do that in 12 minutes, for sure. Does anyone have a desire to discuss the the paradox in the finale? Or is that just me? I can accept uh, it if it's just me. My feelings won't be here. The, you mean uh, tapestry? Okay. Oh, all good things. Uh, all good things. The oh, yeah, my bad. All good things. That's the one with the, uh, I'm the whole dead and I'm God. Uh, yeah, that was tapestry. I, and I wanted to discuss tapestry as well, but 12 minutes is 12 minutes. Yeah. Well, let's definitely make this a two-parter and get I, into the rest of it next time. I I was a little bit uh, dominating on the last discussion. What did someone else pick up the concluding, who's the concluding topic for this, this week's episode? Well, I think uh, we all kind of see ourselves in queue in some ways, because we all have this kind of, as at least as children, I think we all have this, Q is a little bit like a sort of Peter Pan type character, because, I mean, he's immortal, he's a prankster, and he doesn't take things seriously. Everything's a big joke. And that's an important aspect of the character. And uh, we can, I think all of us, can sort of see ourselves in that in some ways because I mean, we've all sort of, uh, as children, taken a view a little bit like that some of the time. You know what? I, just that everyone know what I mean here. You know that he, he has this sort of playful spirit with with really serious things. He has this playful childish spirit. You know, I think he's sort of a child on the inside. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, there's no maturity there. Yeah, and so we've all we all sort of started from that immaturity and hopefully grew as. Well, yeah, and that was the whole concept of True Land to begin with. You find oh, out yeah. that he is a kid, and that his parents call him on the carpet. Of uh, Trelane, <laughs> yeah. Come home, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was Trelane. Um, there's a fan work that actually, or not a fan work. There's a there's an audio book. Yeah. There, Oh, well, yeah, I guess it was adapted into an audiobook. But there's a, a fan work, or, or no, a, a fan work. There's a non canon st- official Star Trek novel that's non canon of a confrontation between Trelane and Q. It's not particularly yeah. well written, but it suggests that Trelane sort of comes from the same sort of place. Oh, in, in that particular work, Trelane is Q's son. Oh, really? Yes. He's Keegan Delancey's character? I don't, know, I don't know if he's Keegan Delancey's character, but it's implied that he's his son. Wow. That must have been before Voyager, then. Probably. Yeah, so yeah, later... Him in the end and says, I'm sorry, son. So later, um, later Star Trek pretty much contradicted that. <laughs> yeah. But... Still, the stories are similar enough that it does suggest that perhaps Trelane is sort of a toddler Keegan Delancey, kind of. That, that might be possible. I kind of doubt it, but it's possible. Or maybe Trelane is 
Keegan's son. He's like a third generation Q who went way back to the beginning. <laughs> All kinds of interesting possibilities. Oh, anyway, yeah, like uh, thought experiments you've been here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining us on another insightful and inspiring episode of Trekosophy, the Star Trek Philosophy Podcast. You can get more episodes and awesomeness at trekosophy.com. That's T-R-E-K-O-S-O-P-H-Y. And uh, make sure and uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, email us at trekosophy at gmail.com, tell us what idiots we are. Leave all kinds of scathing, horrible, one-star negative reviews on iTunes. And uh, always tip your waitresses. Good advice. <laughs> um, uh, we'll catch up with you guys next week. Yeah. Cue will. <laughs>